You are very welcome along to the Classic Game Club here on OTB and Virgin Media Sport. It's Owen Sheehan with you for the next hour in the steady company of Ger Gilroy and Nathan Murphy. Over the course of the next hour, we're going to be chatting through that famous second leg of the Champions League semi-final in 1999 when Manchester United went to Turin, came from two goals down and qualified for the Champions League final in their treble season. So we're going to be parsing through the events of that game over the next little while as we pick our moments of the match, our secret man of the match, our sliding doors moments, and much, much more. We start, as ever, with our memories of the match. Ger Roy, you're welcome along. Uh, you were a college kid when Roy Keane was killing Zinedine Zidane in Italy. Yeah, I was doing my finals. Um, I actually distinctly remember the final being in the library for the vast majority of the game and only watching the last 10 minutes. Like, that's how disciplined slash in need of cramming I was because uh, it was the night before an exam. And uh, watched the last 10 minutes and caught the whole thing. It was, uh, it was the best way to watch the final. Semi-final, I remember, like, just taking the night off because, like, the exams are still three weeks away, so it'll be grand what could possibly go wrong. And uh, watched the whole thing. And just remember, like, I wasn't a Man United fan, but, like, being really up for this team because they had come so close in recent seasons and they had not quite got over the line. So it almost felt like the league that we had invested so much of our time in watching wasn't of the same quality as the rest of the world's football, that actually we were missing out on the best football because it was being played by Juventus or even that young Ajax team or perhaps even in Spain, even though Spanish football wasn't as strong at that stage as it, as it becomes subsequently. So there was a sense that, like, you wanted this team to do well, even though they'd killed my beloved Aston Villa again and again and again and again and again in uh, in recent seasons. And sorry, how did that academic year turn out for you? Uh, I got a 2-1. Oh, not, I mean, bad. Exactly not bad. As you, exactly as you would anticipate. <laughs> Uh, Nathan, uh, I think we're all familiar with Manchester United fans who've banged on about this game for 21 years. It stands the test of time. How many of the details did you remember rewatching it this week? I remember Keane's yellow card and I remember the goals. Uh, but I was in the middle of studying for my leaving search, which was just a matter of weeks away. So I suspect I was using every single possible opportunity to get out of studying <laughs> that evening to sit down and watch the match. Uh, but as Jer said, like it was a Manchester United side who, despite their total dominance in the Premier League and winning four of the previous six leagues, had sort of flattered to deceive when it came to the really big moments in European football. And you didn't hold out much hope for them going to Turin. They'd been beaten there in each of the previous two seasons by Juventus. A Juventus side that when you look through the team, particularly that midfield, even if they were missing Del Piero, which was just stacked full of talent and players who you'd have to imagine should have been full of confidence considering both Deschamps and Zidane had won the World Cup just a year earlier. But somehow United decided this was the night they were going to stand up and Roy Keane decided this was the night they were going to stand up and really you'd have to say probably change the legacy of this team forever. Absolutely. Uh, let's give a, a full picture of the context of that night. So Manchester United looking to win the European Cup for the first time since 1968, of course, to get drawn in the group of death in this season's competition, managing to sneak through behind Bayern Munich, but ahead of Barcelona. In the quarterfinals then, Ronaldo and Inter Milan sit in their way. A 2-0 win at Old Trafford is decisive in ending that tie. But Juventus in the first leg Hang of this... On, Hang on, hang on, because th 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 that's very important. That game is not mm. just Ronaldo, it's Diego Simeone. Diego Simeone, who, which... If you remember, got David Beckham sent off in the World Cup, the same World Cup that France had won. It's Simeone riding around in agony after Beckham flicks his little leg out at him. Pretty, pretty leg. And so, like, that was the first time, they, that was the biggest story in English football. They burned effigies of David Beckham. The opening game of the season was at West Ham. And the, the, the Man United bus had to run the gauntlet of the West Ham fans because the Sun had whipped up such a frenzy about David Beckham in the aftermath of that. And uh, the bus was like, they, had, they threw stones at it. Every touch he had in the first game of the season was booed. And here he is crushing Simeone in the quarterfinals. So maybe they're a team of destiny. Who knows? Mm, it's, a, it's a huge part of that, David Beckham. And I guess it, when you talk about the, the context as a whole, looking at the two teams and all the various storylines are key. But just to kind of finish the, the thread of the chronological events there for anybody who wasn't aware, as you say, the, the Inter Milan thing is huge. But then Juventus do have a, a better result in Manchester to get the one-all draw. But it is a 90-second minute equaliser from Ryan Giggs in the first leg. In between the two legs then, Ryan Giggs uh, is at it again. He scores that wonder goal against Arsenal in the FA Cup 
and all of a sudden then the treble is on the cards. Just on Juventus then, very quickly, Carlo Ancelotti, he's been in the job since February. Alessandro Del Piero had done his cruciate early in the season and their domestic form basically went off a cliff. Lippi lost his job. Uh, they finished seventh in Serie A eventually. But they have made it back to the Champions League semi-finals. They've made it to the three consecutive finals before that, although they have lost uh, the previous two. And then it just kind of comes back to this idea, as you mentioned, Nathan, of Deschamps and Zidane being world champions, being at the very top of the world. But Jar, as you rightly have touched on here, David Beckham, the, the context is key. This was a season of redemption for David Beckham, 98, 99. Was it his peak? He's really, 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 really good in this game. Like, I, I, I wonder if we've kind of gone full 360 on David Beckham where... Um, it was, ah, uh, you know, he's a bit flash, isn't he? Actually, he's pretty good. He scored loads of goals. Oh, petulant. It's all about the ego. It's it's all about Bram Beckham. It's it's him and his wife making money for their family. What a horrible thing that is in modern-day football. To him doing really well in world football polls to the point where he was like, oh, he's completely overrated, David Beckham. And uh, I don't know if you remember David Beckham's amazing free kick against Greece that uh, qualifies England for that tournament. And um, everybody's like, well, if he hadn't been you know, running all over the pitch for the whole game and he stayed in his position and maybe they wouldn't have been in such difficult, uh, such dire need of a late equaliser against a crappy Greece team. The thing is, I think David Beckham got so overrated, he has become slightly underrated after the backlash against him being, uh, I've talked myself around here, <laughs> overrated. He's brilliant in this game. Really, really brilliant in this game. Uh, we, we, do do, we do do a thing in the Classic Game Club here and we'll get to it at the end where we over or underrate uh, each and every player that's worth something in this. We'll get to Beckham later on and give the final verdict on that. Nathan, this was the summer that Beckham was due to get married, actually, 1999. This was mm -hmm. uh, peak Posh and Bex. In Dublin. In Dublin, of course. Um, what, what was your view on, on Beckham in and around 99? I always liked Beckham as a player. I always thought he was somewhat underrated and because of the fact he was so flash got a huge amount of stick in a team that generally away from him wasn't particularly flash. It was all about the grit of Keane and you know, Skull's been very understated. But like his deliveries in this game, and again, Jared touches on the free kick against Greece. I was watching back some of his Premier League goals over the last 24, 48 hours. The amount of brilliant free kicks he consistently scored. He was the best right midfielder in Europe for a considerable period of time. And he went to Real Madrid, even when Alex Ferguson, you probably felt, was sick of him, and went to Real Madrid and did brilliantly because they still rated him. So maybe it was Ferguson, much like he did with Roy Keane, trying to ensure that nobody gave credit to Beckham for a huge amount, that he sort of destroyed his... I don't want to say his, his personality, but what people thought of him, that maybe he wasn't professional enough. Whereas I don't think I've ever heard a colleague of David Beckham ever talk him down. Everybody talks about his work ethic. And like Beckham is probably reflective of this United side in that we think about them in hindsight. But going into this game, like their greatness is not set in stone in any way. It is mm. just a week since Geek scores that goal against Arsenal. So they're into an FA Cup final. But they're still just a point ahead of Arsenal in the Premier League. And this is an Arsenal team who've come onto the scene under Arsene Wenger with Overmars and Vieira and Bergkamp and were probably still favourites at that stage of the season to go on and win the title. So whereas we can look back now and say, yeah, this team arguably up there as the greatest Premier League team of all time because of what they achieved with the treble. I think going into this game, there were probably still huge doubts as to just how good they were. Mm, absolutely. I think, people, I think people thought they were flaky. Like when it came to the European competition, that it was so easy for them on the domestic front until Arsene Wenger arrived and, and put up, up to them properly. And then there's a flakiness in the big European matches that they hadn't seen through. And in the first 10 minutes, bear in mind, again, the point that you made earlier on, it was a late Ryan Giggs goal that scrapes a one-all draw at home against this Juventus team whose domestic form is not great and who don't have two, well, two very important players. And... And they go 2-0 down in the first 10 minutes. Like, I'd say a lot of people were looking around going, well, this is, this is very typical Man United here. Mm. The two uh, Juventus players that you're mentioning there is obviously Del Piero, but also Thierry Henry, who's uh, cup tied for this particular game. Just to go through the starting 11s here, uh, Juventus, uh, Peruzzi in goals, a f a back four of Birandelli, Ferrara, Juliano, Passato, midfield of Conte, Deschamps, Davids, Delivio, not bad, and then Zidane in the 10 role uh, behind Inzaghi. So a 4-4-1-1 four, four, one, one 
from Juventus on the night, managed, of course, by Carlo Ancelotti. Manchester United, on the other hand, Ryan Giggs injured for this game. Paul Scholes might have started, but he doesn't. They've got uh, Peter Schmeichel in goals, a back four of Gary Neville, Janssen, Stam and Irwin. Beckham, Keane, Butt and Blomqvist in midfield with Cole and York up front. Paul Scholes versus Nicky Butt might have been the decision here, Ger, but uh, Butt obviously gets the nod. Yeah, and, and I, I, like you look back again when you do research for this, and there's loads of big games that Nicky Butt gets selected ahead of Paul Scholes for. There's um, the Arsenal games that season, for example, as well. And I, I don't know, certainly the, the Paul Scholes story hasn't been fully written just yet. And perhaps because Scholes has two or three acts, there's the retirement and there's the comeback. But there's also the post Keane era where he becomes a deeper lying midfielder. And I, I do wonder what, why Alex Ferguson in this like era defining match decides to leave Scholes on the bench. And I, I wonder if perhaps there's a bit of revisionism about Scholes' importance to the team at this stage of his career anyway, that he's not the big dog. He's not the, the match winner that Ferguson needed. That he, he actually was picking a team specifically for this game, granted. The, the midfield that um, that Juventus have is absolutely world class. Two World Cup winners. One of them is Zidane. Edgar Davids is at the absolute peak of his powers as well. So maybe he just felt that there was more physicality, a uh, uh, contained and organised physicality, on the part of Nicky Butt than you were going to get from Skulls, as we see from the tackle that Skulls ultimately gets booked for. Yeah, the tackle he gets booked for should have been a straight red card and. It's interesting because I did always wonder why so much was always made of Roy Keane missing the final and not Paul Scholes. But then you do look at the team selections. Any big game in those latter months of the season, he ended up missing out on a lot of them. Didn't start away in Milan against Inter in the quarterfinal either. And as Jer said, the two Arsenal games. And now when you talk about Paul Scholes, people talk like he was some sort of a clone of Xavi and Iniesta mixed together. But at this stage of his career, he clearly wasn't trusted by Ferguson on the big occasion. And... The fact that Nicky Butt, even if even if Ryan Giggs wasn't injured, I think there's a possibility that, well, Nicky Butt may have started out on the left-hand side. Mm. They could have done all sorts of things and played. I don't think Scholes was ever going to start this game. He, maybe because, as Jer said, Keane goes into a slightly more deeper position as, as his career rolls on. But certainly you do look at Paul Scholes slightly differently. And I know Ferguson says after the game that they were thinking they wish they could appeal both yellow cards. Like, Skulls was an absolute shocker of a challenge in Deschamps. Yeah, it's a two-footed, it's right over the ball. It's it's a straight red, as Jura says. Like, do we think that Skulls, in the years after this, manages to achieve a level where the Xavi and Iniesta comparisons aren't that ridiculous? Well, they changed the system. So, obviously, a key part of this United team is that they play the most straight 4-4-2 you mm. could possibly imagine and go with Cole and York up front. Once Van Nistelrooy comes to the club, suddenly there's a better position for Paul Scholes just in behind, almost as a as a number 10 and is given a lot more freedom. So maybe playing in that more structured role alongside a Roy Keane where he would have to cover a lot of ground, would probably need to just keep think, things ticking over and wouldn't really be in a position to score as many goals as he ultimately ended up doing for Manchester United. That him, Scholes, and your, him, Cole, and York in the same team was probably too much of a risk. Yeah, it pr probably was all... I don't know, I mean... We well, you, you look to the the final in 08 and um, b before the match, Alex Ferguson guarantees goals a place and he's playing alongside Carrick in that one. So, like, you would have thought that they could have done exactly... I think I think Skulls changes and evolves as a player, becomes a smarter player. He becomes less of the... I'm, you know, he becomes less of the Frank Lampard type of midfielder whose job it is, or the Steven Gerrard, whose job it is to be on the end of a move and somebody who actually back and starts trying to dictate games and I think he could have done that with Keane and it would have been very interesting to see what that Man United team would have evolved into but they got absolutely battered in 2008 or 2009 sorry 2008 go on yeah yeah they, they do okay in 08 they, they go home with the trophy uh, let's move on to uh, moments of the match. This is where we pick uh, three of the highlights from the 90 minutes and uh, get stuck into them. Lads, there are tons of these. We've managed to distill it down to three. We're going to talk about Pippo and Zaghi. We're going to talk about Roy Keane. And we're going to talk about Zinedine Zidane here. I'm going to lead things off here with Nzagi because chronologically it is the first moment of the game. It is the opening. I want to call it his, his first 10, 12 minutes as a moment in and of itself. Pippo Nzagi is licking his chops at the look of Yapstam and Janssen at this point.
he's running rings around them without Del Piero and Thierry Henry. Juventus fans are thinking to themselves, God, we're a little bit screwed up front here. But not when you got Pippo and Zaghi. Scores the most typical in Zaghi goal with the first one. The second one, complete fluke. Uh, it, the, the ball deflects off Yapstam, loops over Schmeichel's head. There's a bit of luck with that. But Nathan, I think on the, the first one, it is shambolic defending to say the very least at a corner from an Alex Ferguson managed side to allow Inzaghi to just dart in at the back post and put Juventus 1-0 up on the night Ah the whole thing is a calamity from the short corner which is you know Martin O'Neill-esque when you think back to Ireland's defeat in Scotland where they just don't bother closing him down and it's Zidane Zidane who you've given time on the ball to pick out Inzaghi but then you get into Gary Neville at the back post it's 1999 I'm spending my Saturday nights in Midas nightclub. Sometimes things might get out of hand and the bouncer just try and shove you out the door a little bit and then he'd give up and think it's not worth the hassle and let you back and let you off. And that's sort of what Gary Neville did. He was halfway towards pushing him out and then never looked at the ball. Like, this is the most basic defending you would have thought from Gary Neville and let Inzaghi away with it and ultimately cost United a goal, like what could have been a crucial goal so early in the game. It's, it's some of the worst defending. Totally back to the ball, eyes on the player and then didn't actually take care of Inzaghi. I love Pippo and Zaghi. He has got the dark arts down to the... He's like a, a proper Harry Potter level sorcerer when it comes to what you're supposed to... How you're supposed to be onside, particularly at that stage. Like, there's a there's a goal in the second half that he scores where he, he's, like, literally a mile offside. Uh, and I, I mean, like, a country mile <laughs> offside. And he's he has the goal to celebrate. Probably knowing full well. That in the in the Calciopolis era of Juventus, there's a lot of those goals that he gets given. <laughs> Actually, you're like, yeah, good man, people, off you go. The referee flag stays there, and there's no VAR, and everybody goes home and goes, oh, referee, linesman, got that wrong. Um, but look, I, 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 like, I actually think Janssen and Stan play really well in this game. Mm, I think eventually. they're both they're both brilliant one-on-one defenders, and they both have amazing moments where you're like, hang on, I didn't know he could do that. Ronnie Janssen dribbles past about five players at one point in the second half. Um, and I thought Stam was sensational. After that first 10 minutes, I thought, yep, Stam gave as good a, a, a display of defending as you're ever going to see under the circumstances. And big balls from Stam to come back from that opening 10 minutes where Inzaghi has scored twice. But um, it's, it's, a weird, it's a weird two chances, two goals for, for Juve. And they must have been feeling like, look at, look at our team. Look how amazing we are. We're going to do this tonight. So... It's a, it's a sensational opening to a match. Well, Inzaghi should have scored a hat-trick. Like, you have the, the <clears> situation where the ball gets cleared off the line as well. Then he goes one-on-one, -on -one basically, with Schmeichel in the second half as well. He has five clear-cut opportunities, I think, by my count, and he takes two of them. Uh, like, I, I think it's a little bit harsh to, on, on Inzaghi to say that... Like, I, I guess, actually, it's probably not being harsh at all. You're probably complimenting Inzaghi in terms of his positional awareness, knowing that you could get away with being teetering on the edge of, of the offside rule at the time. You're shaking your head there as if uh, you're... you're uh, oh, no, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Like, you, I, I actually love Inzaghi as a striker. He, he is one of those players who you would hate to be on the opposition team. But if he was on your team, you're like, I love that guy. He's, he's, uh, he's got the street smarts that our team needs. It, there is a lot of uh, huge characteristics shown by Manchester United throughout the course of the 90 minutes. Like, you've got Roy Keane, after getting suspended for the final, putting in an unbelievable performance. And then, as you mentioned as well, Stam has had a fairly tough opening dozen of a few minutes going in up, up against Pippo and Zaghi at this point. He's getting a bit of a runaround, actually, and he's had a moment of unbelievably bad fortune as well with the second goal. Like, it is so easy for heads to drop at that point, but instead they go the other way and actually put in a series of performances that are very, very well remembered two decades later. Well, one of the things that makes this such a great game is that almost everybody played well. It's very difficult to find players who didn't, particularly the best players on the pitch, almost every time they got on the ball, did the right thing. And the first half is as good a first half of football as you will see mm. at a least European level. Couldn't figure out half an hour into the game how Manchester United were so much the better team, considering what had happened in the first 10 minutes. Again, you talk about the character. Like, whether it was luck, whether it was fortuitous, whether it was just brilliance from Inzaghi and taking the two chances when they came. You expected with everything that had gone on before from United in Europe that they would just crumple and that Juventus experienced. They would just play the game out. But for whatever reason, they just couldn't get a grip of it. Maybe it was that force of personality from Keane in particular because they started to dominate midfield. And like they started to go route one, I thought, very quickly after going 2-0 down United. And again, that's where the brilliance of York and Cole yeah. constantly harassing 
the Juventus defence. So this wasn't at times a free-flowing Manchester United counter-attacking team away from home in any way. It was at times, let's just hoof it forward to the two guys up front who were an absolute nuisance and were so well-connected, not just the two of them, but also in being able to bring Blomquist into the game and being able to bring Beckham into the game. So the way United responded, considering all that had gone before, was really top-drawer stuff. And the first half was... Oh, just watch it back again and again. Yeah, and I think that the second goal, actually, Gary Neville has to have a couple of bites after the cherry to actually go route one to Colin York. Like, he boots the ball forward once. It comes straight back to him. And he's like, no, I'm not going to try something different. I'm going to ping it forward again onto the head of the two lads. And it comes off with uh, the equaliser on the night. Right, the biggest moment of the match is Keane's yellow card. Jer, give us your take on re-watching this. Uh, I, I think the, the details are, are fairly well known. Well... Uh, it, it, the kind of passage of play before it is is fairly interesting. So I think we've got some photographs over here. The first happen when it happens in real time, you're like, "Oh, did he actually get the ball?" And then it's like, "No, it's in a well." We can down. clearly see ball. here that absolutely he does not get the ball. That's uh, conclusive from image number one. Yeah, so he's uh, he's hacking Zidane there, and then Zidane, you know, he's a big man. What do you do? The bigger they the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Uh, and he's flying through the air. So this is clearly like, oh, I'm going to get booked here. This is not Keane's first bad challenge, by the way. This is no. his second bad challenge of the match. I think that's kind of the key issue in all this as well. If it had been his first one, he might have got away with it, but it's actually his second one. Zidane flies through the air, and then the next picture we see is Jesper Blomqvist getting it with both barrels from Roy Keane. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think uh, you don't need to be a lip reader here to know exactly what he's saying on this still image. You can tell that he has some choice words for Jesper Blomqvist. In, in retrospect, I think that Roy Keane could have controlled the ball. I do well, also you think, feel you think. like I, I do also feel this, that this, Nicky Butt has a Nicky Butt has. Let me just finish here. Just let me let you just. You're going to have your chance. Let's just let me finish. I, so Blunkers is in kind of the the uh, inside left position. Looks up, plays an aimless ball in the general direction of Nicky Butt, who's like, "What are you doing? Like it's not actually to me." The ball runs past him. Zidane nips in. Keane is running straight at Nicky Butt and decides not to clatter his own teammate. And so the ball gets knocked past him. Keane puts out the leg stupidly and, uh, and gets booked. And, and really, I think there's like a, there's a coalition of blame for this yellow card, some of which does rest with Roy Keane. And I have no doubt that that's fueling the anger with the, the outburst that he has in the general direction of Lundqvist, to whom he didn't speak, I think, for the rest of the season. I think I think that's on Six record. Weeks. I think he didn't speak for the rest of the season. Six weeks. Well, that's the rest of the season. Mm. We've all heard a million Roy Keane stories. And one of the reasons I was glad to watch this back was to see this yellow card and how it played out. This basically is Roy Keane's Steven Gerrard moment. This is the slip against Chelsea, but he gets away with it because Manchester United turn it around. Firstly, it's much like Gerrard in that it's not a slip. It's just miscontrolled. It's the most basic control from Roy Keane. Yeah, it's a sloppy pass. There's 50 sloppy passes in every game. He's coming onto the ball. All he needs to do is take a touch. Take a touch and skip past Zidane. Instead, he takes his eye off the ball. Maybe the weight of what Zidane Zidane carries is in front of him and he thinks, I don't fancy this. The ball slips under his foot and then he's off balance, lunges into Zidane and turns around to Jasper Blomquist and blames him. I thought this was a guy who always took the responsibility for his actions. Yet in this big moment where he has screwed up massively, ultimately could end up costing his side a Champions League, he's looking to blame somebody else. Come <laughs> are on. you are you seriously are you seriously saying this is the same as Steven Gerrard's clip where Steven Gerrard, the weight of history for that club not being able to win league titles versus a guy who then then actually drives the team forward, who has already scored the goal to get them back into the game at this point. Are you saying that that this is a similar mistake? where the weight of history so bedraggled Steven Gerrard to the point where he does slip. And Demba Ba, the mighty Demba Ba, is the towering presence. Or it's Zinedine Zidane, World Cup winner, slayer of Brazil, slayer of Ronaldo in, you know, seven short months ago, is the person who he's up against. These are not See, similar the, situations. And, the, the slip and isn't I think, the point. I think actually, it's the you know miscontrol. What? It's the miscontrol. And I would say it's a similar situation that there was almost an arrogance. There was a taking your eye off the ball at a crucial moment getting overcome possibly by the weight of the occasion <laughs> that ensures he slips and likewise ensures that Keane ends what? up lunging into Zidane. It's the most simple oh, thing okay, in the world. Okay. This is a man who, let's, like, when you think back to Overall, some of the criticism the he gave, 
to the Ireland team in Euro 2016 about simple things. This is the most simple thing you have to do. It's the middle of midfield. You control the ball. You don't let it slip under your feet. You're it's the Champions League final you're playing in. You're, so, you're starting yeah, to sound Champions like Roy Keane. You can't control the ball. <laughs> There's actually a cork twang coming into your accents the more you actually talk about this, Nathan. Uh, just to go through uh, some of the things that were said afterwards, I, I got a great level of admiration for Blomqvist who comes out like afterwards and is like, I think Roy was just disappointed because he knew what the card meant and he needed someone to shout at. It was understandable, but I shouted back because at the time I thought he was being a bit unfair to me. When I look at it afterwards, I don't feel it was such a bad pass. It was more a bad touch and in the centre of the pitch. Six weeks is a long time to hold a grudge for a bad touch. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. Look, I definitely team could have done much better. That's the thing. I, I actually uh, the comparison with Stephen Gerrard is a great comparison to make because obviously Keane wins that all day long and twice on Sundays because Roy Keane does respond by giving one of his mm. all-time defining performances in the aftermath of that. And actually, the whole point about the yellow card is that it doesn't interrupt Keane's response in any way before the game. Before the yellow card, he was the one who was driving them forward. He's the one who scores with the header from uh, the corner. 10 minutes before the yellow card, but his performance level doesn't dip despite the fact he knows he's missing. And I think the big thing about this yellow card, and we should mention it from a context point of view, and Nathan, you brought this up, was that this is the same pitch that Paul Gascoigne famously breaks down crying when he gets a second yellow card and is going to miss a World Cup final if England actually make it there, but obviously they don't because, mm. you know, mm. they can't win their finals. Uh, and so in English football culture, there is this whole notion of the fact that oh, that's what happens to your star player when he gets booked and is going to miss. He falls apart and breaks down and Gary Lineker has to go. He's crying and tell the whole world and helpfully, you know, uh, make make everybody aware of the mental fragility. With Keane, that didn't happen. And in fairness to Edgar Davids, it didn't happen to him. And I think Scholes was reasonable after his yellow card as well. But, um, like, a great comparison with Steven Gerrard because it's completely wrong. <laughs> I think the Gascoigne... Uh, comparison is interesting though because maybe that is what has fed in to all the stories of Roy's performance which was clearly exceptional that night but as Roy would say himself what else was he going to do you know mm. you don't pay the po you don't praise the postman for delivering the post like his job mm. is to be a footballer just because one player nine years previously at the same stadium started crying when he got booked like, Roy Keane was never going to do that he was always just going to keep playing his game and as Ter said Davids just kept playing his game Skulls just kept playing his game. It, it, the rarity is when somebody does the opposite and throws the toys out of the pram. I, I will say the whole, the postman doesn't get congratulated for delivering the post line was a little bit in spite of Alex Ferguson because it's Ferguson's quote that gets put to him after they've fallen out. So Ferguson's quote from, I'm not, I think one of his books, or maybe the one in 99 is, uh, the most emphatic display of selflessness I have seen on a football field pounding over every blade of grass, competing as if he would rather die of exha exhaustion than lose, he inspired all around him. I felt such an honour to be associated with such a player. And now that quote gets put to Roy Keane in uh, the Best of Enemies doc, Keane and Vieira. And then that's when Keane is like, so stuff like that almost insults me. Like That's as much to do with Alex Ferguson saying it as the idea that he was brilliant and pounding over every uh, blade of grass. Like, I get the sentiment. It's, okay. a, it's a very Roy Keane thing it's to say. Okay. It is, it is. But it, it's a very Roy Keane thing saying that it's wrong. Like, he knows he knows it's wrong. He knows that, like, it's okay for people to like footballers. He knows that when he was a kid, if he'd seen that performance, he would have been inspired by it. He knows that, like, he has had an exceptional career. The, like, this is our chance to talk about Keane generally in the game. Like, I thought he, he was exceptional, but I actually didn't think he was way better than any of the other performances that we've seen from Keane because his level was so high. Like, in retrospect... I think that there has been a bit much made of his individual performance when, as you say, Nathan, everybody on the team played really well. And in fact, on both teams, that's why the first mm. half of that football match is as good a first half, or is, is as good a, it's as good as football can be, where there is this mad seesaw where one team who is absolutely sensational at home is hammering the opposition after 10 minutes and the other team comes right back into it and it's right balanced on a knife edge. It's balanced on a knife edge because players of the calibre of Roy Keane, an, an era-defining central midfielder, plays to his level. And his level was great all the time. Mm. And I think that's the, the key point with Keane, is that like, it's the consistency over such a long period of time that defines his greatness, as opposed to in this one game where he gets the ball and dribbles past five players. That wasn't, that wasn't what made him great. Like mm. He wasn't dropping 50 points like Michael Jordan, but his competitiveness meant that he was dominating opponents from the first minute to the last minute 
week in, week out, and the opposition's soul got broken by that. Just last word on Keane, Nathan. Uh, yeah, I think people watching this back will be waiting for lots of big Roy Keane moments. I was waiting for a moment where he nails Zidane and that this is sort of the turning point of the game that Juventus have this supremacy and then there's a Overmars style challenge from Keane. That doesn't really come. As Jer says, this is just Roy Keane doing the right thing at the right time consistently. There's occasions where he gets the ball in midfield and the Juventus midfield have gone missing and you think, oh, he's going to drive on here 30, 40 yards. He doesn't. He just plays a simple ball out to his left-hand side to Blomquist. Does winning nice little headers here and there. It, it, like There's a stage during the second half where he's absolutely skinned alive by Zidane, which again is, doesn't really fit in with the narrative of what you hear 20 years on. I just think it was probably in retrospect because of the yellow card and the way he reacted, it was overblown slightly. He was a brilliant player on a night of brilliant performances. That is Roy Keane's yellow card, our second moment of the game. Our last moment of the match. Nathan, you can lead us off here. Which Zidane moment have you picked? Uh, well, there could have been many because mm. it was pretty much a flawless performance from Zinedine Zidane. Uh, like We're talking about an era of unbelievable number 10s. Rivaldo's World Footballer of the Year that year. Figo is around as well. But Zidane, every time he touches the ball, it is just absolutely glorious. It's the sort of performance zone that if you know they were to have a player cam and just shine it on Zinedine Zidane, <laughs> maybe put some nice atmospheric music behind it. I'd watch a full 90 minutes of that, preferably <laughs> with music from a Scottish band. Somebody should really go to do that someday. The moment I picked, though, is in the second half, where again, I thought this was the moment. Keane is close by. He's just inside the United half, and he's surrounded by three, four United players, and he just jinxes his way, twists, turns, and suddenly has the freedom of the stadium in front of him. It looked like it was an impossible situation that he was going to lose possession, but he was just constantly so, so calm. Always just keeps the ball at arm's length. And he's so strong. He's never going to be overawed by going up against a Roy Keane and Nicky Butter, a defensive side. I just think part of the problem for Zidane in that game was that Ancelotti got it wrong. And maybe it was because Del Piero wasn't there. And that even though he was playing in what you would see as his preferred number 10 role. He was playing right up at times in the first half in particular, just behind Inzaghi, and probably wasn't involved as much as you would want because as I say, every time he got on it, he did something. Sure. I, th that bit um, where you're talking about, there, there's so many instances of, of people who have great close control. They have a moment of great close control and they pass it to somebody and nothing happens to it. But I'm pretty sure it's actually Irwin. I watched it back. Irwin is the other one of the other Man United players. I think there's four he takes out in that kind of post box uh, area and hits a flick. And then the ball gets pumped through and there's, there's actually a really good chance that comes off it. There's also a beautiful slide rule through, through ball for Inzaghi where Inzaghi mm. gets taken out by Schmeichel. Now, I think, I think they say he's offside. But again, there's no proper review it looked like it would have it would have been a penalty, and uh, Inzaghi's like, oh, I didn't get the penalty. But um, look, he was sensational, and I, you know, it it the fact that him and Keane both play at this level in this game, like this makes it one of the best games that I've seen. It really does because you're talking about the best footballers playing unbelievably well over the course of the whole game. It's, just, it's just a sensational spectacle. Do you know when you're at an airport and you're quickly going between A and B and you're on the travelator and you're kind of smugly looking at people frantically speed walking beside you but you're actually going at the same pace? That's what Zinedine Zidane <laughs> is operating <laughs> off during this game. Everything looks so unbelievably easy, moving in slow motion. Part of me was questioning whether or not he was even up to the pace of the game because he's moving slow, slowly. But actually, turns out he was a little bit injured. He'd come off, he'd come off with an knee injury against Bologna, I think it was the weekend beforehand, and he'd been struggling, I think, with an knee injury ever since the World Cup. So all season, I think you mentioned that in the context. Deschamps and Zidane being icons of France the previous summer. I'd say that was as much to do with Juventus's poor season as it was to do with Del Piero getting a terrible injury as well. It's tough to come off that height of the World Cup and put in a brilliant domestic season. But I just thought Zidane, like just in, in terms of pure close control and skill, if we're just basing it off skill rather than any physical attributes, Zidane is out of this world in this game. Absolutely fantastic. And the, the other thing is uh, that if you go back and read articles from around this time, there was a little bit of a contract dispute going on with Zidane and Juventus. A, a line from The Guardian at the time. Um, last week, uh, despite three years remaining on his contract, Zidane hopes to leave Juve this summer because his wife wants to live by the sea. 
So there you go. Turin, obviously, uh, not the, the most incredible place uh, to live, clearly, as a footballer. Uh, and then the o- only other thing that I would just point out, which showed that perhaps Zidane wasn't no perfect in this, is that after 57 minutes, uh, Zidane drops deep, picks up a brilliant ball, and I'm just waiting for it. I'm like, what is he going to do now? Because he's had an incredible hour so far. But he tries an impossible pass, and it goes over the top of the defence, and I think it just rolls slowly into Peter Schmeichel's arms. So he's not amazing. He's not flawless, but he's pretty Oof. good. That wasn't Daggy's fault. He's amazing. He is amazing. He's not flawless. Uh, I, I'm really glad for him that it worked out and he got his move to uh, that noted seaside town in Madrid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, a couple of years later than that. Uh, I, I presume he got a big fat contract, maybe, after this particular story uh, came out. Right, we've got plenty more to get uh, into. Uh, you're watching the Classic Game Club, I should say, here on OTB and indeed Virgin Media Sport. We're talking about the second leg of the 1999 Champions League semi-final between Juventus and Manchester United. Our secret man of the match is coming up after the break. You're welcome back to the Classic Game Club here on OTB and on Virgin Media Sport. The 1999 second leg of the semi-final between Juventus and Manchester United is what we're talking about in terms of our Classic Champions League matches. Secret man of the match is what we move on to next. I think we've come to the conclusion that Roy Keane is generally viewed as the man of the match in this. So when it comes to secret man of the match, it's somebody basically that's not named Roy Keane. Jer, who have you gone for? Well, I mean, can, it, it has to be Zidane, right? Like it has to, you, you know, if you're just doing this on, this is like the other best player of the game who isn't named Roy Keane, then it has to be Zidane. But I actually think that taking that out because we've already had the Zidane conversation mm. I think there's a case for the recovery that Yap Stam makes and the importance that having somebody like Stam in the team giving a, a sense of calm there's a, there's a few times where a ball does get through or Delivio skins somebody and, and a ball gets passed through and Stam just shepherds him out of the way Paul McGrath style it actually reminded me a lot of, of Paul McGrath's ability to just be one step ahead by not your pace but by reading of the game I thought that was hugely important Really, though, what, what impressed me most watching this back was that David Beckham was almost every bit as influential. He was every bit as influential as Roy Keane was. When the ball needed somebody to get on it and calm it down in that first half when they were 2-0 down, Beckham drifted off his right wing and came to the, the left side of midfield and was playing very deep and has the energy and the engine to be able to get back and, and make sure that he's helping out Gary Neville on the right-hand side. And I just thought that this was the full range of Beckham's ability as a passer, as an athlete, as somebody who had the vision to, again, be in position to control the game and to help control the game, to get Man United back into it when they needed that. So uh, I thought Beckham, again, was outstanding. Yeah, he's brilliant throughout. The range of passing is outrageous from Beckham. It's a position perhaps that we just don't see in football anymore, which we'll get into uh, in a moment. But that right midfielder position, he is one of the, the last grave true right midfielders. He's not a fullback or a right winger. He's just in that position and that deep level of crossing. It works perfect. Uh, and that's why you've got the two up front to, to be able to, to get those balls uh, on top of their heads. Um, Nathan, have you gone for Zidane? I, it's hard to go past it. Um, again, almost flawless. Likewise, I'd agree with Beckham. I thought Edgar Davids for the first half an hour of the game was probably the best player on the pitch. And Ancelotti made a big mistake at halftime when he made his subs- two substitutions because Davids, Delivio, and Inzaghi were killing United down that left hand side. And he moved Delivio. And Davids sort of, he definitely ran out of steam. This entire Juventus team ran out of steam in the last 20 minutes. But Davids just ran the show in midfield for the first 20 minutes, half an hour of the game rarely if ever gave the ball away and just constantly dry, drove Juventus forward. The other one I would pick is Andy Cole. Mm. You could go for York or Cole, but like, this is this mammoth occasion for Manchester United. And Andy Cole, when they were under huge pressure, he's the outlet constantly for Beckham when he's going with mm. those long balls forward, going up against the tough, tough Juventus defence. It's close control every time he gets it. Himself and York, they're understanding everything you would ever want to teach young players as to how to play as a front two if anyone ever gets a chance to play as a front two again. Always within five or six yards of each other or holding it up, waiting for Beckham to come, waiting for Blomquist to come. His pass for York for the second goal, his finish for the third goal. And it's strange when you talk about Manchester United all-time great 11s or even Premier League 11s. You know, Andy Cole rarely gets in. Maybe it's because that when it comes to the big night then in the final, sharing him and Solskjaer are the ones who end up being the heroes. But he scored a huge amount of goals throughout his time 
at Manchester United. And again, I was just surprised almost by how good he was against that quality of opposition. Yeah, there was very little hidden hope about going long to the two guys, I felt. Uh, Joe, you wanted to come in there on, on Colin York. It was a sensational partnership. And this is this is one of the greatest performances you've seen from a front two. Like the, the, the quality of understanding, the, the sense that they actually knew what the other one was going to do, even when they weren't looking at each other. You know, it's kind of easy enough to be telepathic or to like communicate non-verbally. But like with their backs to each other at various stages, there would be a spin and suddenly the ball would arrive exactly where it was supposed to go. Like they, they could both have scored more as well. That was the thing. It wasn't like mm. they weren't creating chances. Um, but I thought they were absolutely sensational. And I, I think, like, you know, we, we were having a conversation during the week about all-time Premier League 11 for Manchester United. And I, there, there's a case that this performance would be exhibit A in the case for both of those to go in. And it's very difficult to break that case as a collective. That So York scored, I think, 27 goals and, and assisted 24 that season. David Beckham assisted 24 this season. And that's their best ever seasons in terms of assists for Manchester United. York's performance is mm. off the charts over the course of that year. And bear in mind, he's, he's just arrived at the club. Stam has just arrived at the club. They, they arrived in the same off-season as well. So, like, I, I just think that the ability to settle into a team, to be so, to get so high so quickly, um, like, York, I think, is one of the great unfulfilled Manchester United careers on the basis that he kind of takes the foot off the gas a good bit after this. 24 assists is an unbelievable tally, not least when you've got somebody else who's got 24 assists themselves in the very same team. I think they deserve so much more credit and I think as a duo they definitely deserve to be in the conversation when it comes to these all-time Premier League 11s for Manchester United. Just one more shout for Secret Man of the Match, Dennis Irwin. Like you talk about the two boys up front holding the ball up for David Beckham on the right. What about holding the ball up for Dennis Irwin on the left? Should have scored, hmm. hits the post, almost ends uh, Antonio Conte's career just by embarrassing Antonio Conte so many times. He's sensational, he's brilliant. Like, if you talk about all-time Premier League 11s for a football club, Dennis Irwin is almost always on that team sheet for Manchester United. Brilliant at getting forward, although there's probably a little bit of criticism in the first half where he gets caught a little bit too much in the first half when Juventus are just living on the counter-attack. But I like that. I, I, I admire the, the ballsiness of that to be uh, a couple of goals down and still trying to push forward and create something. If he gets the goal, I think we're all talking about this as Dennis Irwin and one of the most majestic performances in his career. I'm not going to allow that separation of four inches to decipher whether or not he could be secret man of the match. He is. He's up there. He's, he's a contender. And uh, like I think this is very, very close to peak Irwin, is it not? Oh, you would you would absolutely think so. It's just 12 months on from the time that Mick McCarthy told him he would have to prove himself because he wasn't getting in the Ireland set up. He was behind various constellation of other fullbacks that we had at that stage. And Irwin would go away in international duty, sit on the bench for the whole game and not, not get on. And he'd have a chat with Mick and then he'd get on a bit for the next game and then he might get a start and then he'd be in and out. And it was like, what? Look at this guy. Look at him. Put him in the team. Do you think, do you think like, maybe that was the motivation that brought him onto this level and the big European nights? I, I do think that Mick McCarthy was a better man motivator than Alex Ferguson. Yes, Nathan. <laughs> well, what, like, did, did uh, do you think Mick McCarthy was uh, proved wrong then in the end by a, a performance like this? Did he prove himself to Mick McCarthy in the end? The five Premier League medals he won, or was it six? I, I can't remember. I'm not sure if it was that on the table that was glistening that maybe was in Mick's eye when he was uh, when he was sitting down to assess which of his fullbacks he was going to try and shoehorn into the team. But given that Irwin could play both right back and left back, mm. I mean, I think there might have been. Um, I think there's the bones of something there that might we might see later on in a couple of years' time, whenever everything erupts. That is like there's a there's just there's this little. This is just a little fleck of sand that grows into something much bigger. <laughs> what, Roy not taking responsibility for his actions, like when he got the yellow card and tried to blame Jasper Blancas? Yeah, or, or the fact that, you know, Roy didn't organise the uh, training pitch of the balls properly in Saipan. You're, you're saying Saipan was born in Turin in April 1999. That's basically your theory. Well, I'm just say that it's, uh, it's obviously, it's death by a thousand cuts, Owen. That's what it is. It's death by a thousand cuts. I can see it now. It's like the 10-part Saipan documentary. It opens with a cold open, the Alps overlooking Turin, Roy Keane shouting at uh, Blomqvist, and you've got uh, Dennis Irwin hitting the post. That, that is how the documentary starts. Yeah, one of Europe's best fullbacks not capable of getting in the Ireland team. It I, does seem a little ridiculous, taking away all the joking, right? It does seem a little ridiculous that Dennis Irwin, 
had to struggle to get into the Ireland team. It seems a little bit ridiculous that Dennis Irwin wasn't one of the first names on that team sheet. No? Ah, listen, absolutely. When you look at the way he performed that night, it was great to see Irwin as well. Like, there was a real, uh, maybe it was the fact that they were in pretty dire straits when they were 2-0 down, but like skinning people up the left-hand side. And you say, if he got the goal, it just caps this. Probably a far more memorable performance. We're maybe not talking about Roy Keane quite as much as we're talking about Dennis Irwin if he proves to be the match winner. But everything I remember of Irwin is just how steady he was and probably slightly different to the more modern uh, mm. Andy Robertson style left back who's up and down, whereas actually in that game, he was up and down constantly. Absolutely. That's exactly what I t took away from it as well. That I definitely, steady is one of the things I associate with, with Dennis Irwin as well. But he's actually, he's also pinging balls like Trent Alexander-Arnold. A couple mm. of times he, he, he passes a, a crossfield ball perfectly as well. Um, so yeah, I think Dennis Irwin definitely uh, our final contender for a secret man of the match. We're moving on now to 2020 vision. So these are the sorts of things that would slot in well with today's football and some of the things that wouldn't. Uh, let's start with two up front in general because this is an exhibition, as we've already mentioned, of, of two up front. Cole and York playing together and a telepathic understanding between them. It complements perfectly uh, the 4-4-2. It's not something we see today, but it's something you kind of have a yearning for after watching this. Yeah, you're very reliant on your two players having the understanding that Cole and York had. You look at the Premier League right now, who plays two up front? Burnley? Is Sean Dyche watching that back Ferguson from 99 and thinking this is the way forward? And most teams are going with some form of a 4-2-3-1 style of formation. It was very much of its time, but when it works as well as York and Cole did... Perhaps it's the fact and the value of attacking players that if you're going with two out-and-out -out strikers, are you going with two real attacking wingers as well or two workmen-like wingers? Like which is better value for a club, to have one outstanding Harry Kane-style striker or to try and split it between two? I'm not quite sure, but you would love to see a team like this. But maybe it only works because of the quality just behind as well. Yeah. Uh, it, look, it's a really good question. Could this team now win the Premier League playing this way? Like, I, I think that they would press. I think that you would, like, Beckham's athleticism allows you to do so much because you can have the two guys up front and they are hustling and harassing and kind of giving a nightmare to the Juventus defence. But equally, you can use Beckham to push forward if you want to. And like with Butt in midfield, you can do that further up the pitch as well. And again, you've got supreme athleticism from Keane. And Blunkist, actually, I thought was was much better than I remember Jesper Blunkist being. Like, he obviously doesn't play very much after this. This is essentially the end of his career coming fairly soon uh, because of injury. So never really got to see the best of him. But, you know, again, very athletic, very capable on the ball, apart from that one missed pass, obviously, in the middle of uh, the, the first half to force Roy Keane to get the booking. Um I, like I think that this partnership, I'd love to see them now. They're they're amazing, and and maybe in in reality today, uh, Dwight York drops back ten or fifteen yards, and Cole is a bit more isolated when you're out of possession. And uh, I don't know. I, I like I don't know why football has changed to the point where this couldn't work now. Well, look, is it not a situation where you have one of them through the middle, one of them on the left, and David Beckham on the right hand side, and it's uh, a front three, a la Manchester City? Are you not yeah, wasting Beckham? Beckham, really, Beckham? Is Beckham more not li yeah. likely to be a, a fullback? Yeah, well, true. You want his deep crossing. Yeah, so that, like that, that's probably it then, isn't it? Ha has the advancements of the fullback actually killed the, the 4 4 2? Because there was no need eventually for your left midfielder and your right midfielder. There's a famous clip on YouTube of the slowest race of all time between Beckham and Ian Hart, where the two lads are at full tilt and it's like. There's a, there's a granny walking past them. But, you know, like Beckham doesn't have the pace to be a modern day fullback. True. Maybe Beckham is the midfielder. Maybe like he's the third midfielder. So it's him, Skulls, and Keane behind a front three of it would be Giggs if he was fit and Cole through the middle and Dwight York on the right hand side. Because York actually started out kind of playing on the wing good bit for Aston Villa when he broke through first. Mm. It, but it's not as much fun. No, it's it's, hmm. it's not like you want you want the two. There, there's there's definitely something far more iconic about a duo up front rather than the sort of mix and match nature that you can see with something like Manchester City, like the the, the buddy cop nature of having a two up front. There's something class about it. And like I was actually going to ask about Beckham and where he would fit in today. Like if, if you copied and pasted David Beckham to today, I think you mentioned full back. But I was I was going to ask the same question about 
Zinedine Zidane and like maybe at times a lack of pace as well. Does that mean that Zidane, 21 years later, would have less of an impact in the game than he did in 98, 99? I'm not saying he wouldn't be a world-class player. I'm just saying in terms of being one of the very best in the world. You can see loads no, of I managers so. going. Fact, now. Go for it, Nathan. Yeah, I, I think what probably would have happened with Zidane was he would play anywhere in a three-man midfield or maybe even at the top of a diamond or as his career went, sort of fall into a more of a Luka Rodgers position and just sit at the base there and keep things nicely ticking over and pl sort of playing that, as Beckham ended up being that Hollywood-style quarterback. Now, a player of Zidane's, and not just his quality, but also his strength, mm. would have no problem fitting into the modern game. Sure, what do you reckon? You can see that there would be loads of the technical directors and the uh, head of football who look at his stats and say, no, that's not for me and I don't want him in my team. But then there would be the outliers, the managers who actually find a way to use this transcendent talent in the way that he's supposed to be used and uh, get him on the ball early and often. And like, I, I don't know, maybe he's like it's just a central midfielder, but that feels like you're wasting him further at the pitch. And like, you know, so if you were to, to play him in that uh, three up front, um, I, you're not playing with one on the right and one on the left. You are playing with somebody right behind uh, a number nine. And, like, that would be sensational. Yeah. Like, it, I think as well, these copy and paste conversations take don't take into account the fact that if Zinedine Zidane is born 20 years later, an academy somewhere gets their hands on him and they morph him into the physical specimen that he needs to be to get the best out of his specific sets of talents and maybe that yard of pace could be taught to him a little bit earlier on or, or maybe the, the physicality that he already has is actually enhanced and he becomes a really tough midfielder as well just because he's so unbelievably talented there's no way that he can go missing I, I just wonder if he can still reach those unbelievable heights uh, 20 years down the line but, but it's, it's an interesting question Zidane Beckham and then the, the two up front certainly things with a bit of uh, 2020 vision that kind of stick out to me, as well as uh, a couple of the, the style decisions, lads. And I think uh, there was nothing wrong ever with uh, a Serie A 90s jersey. The Kappa Juventus jersey is something uh, we've all picked out. Like, I'm not sure if, mm. if you have, like, a favourite uh, Italian jersey from the 90s, but th this is uh, Fiorentina, Batistuta, Fiorentina, every time. The, the the Mars Napoli jersey that uh, Diego Maradona mm -hmm. wore, I like that um, just because it was Maradona. I was I was a Milan fan because they had Hulup and Baston and Reichardt and those red and black stripes I thought were always cool. But this Kappa gear, you're looking at it going, wow, that's pretty sweet. Yeah, the uh, AC Milan one was obviously Kappa as well, wasn't it? The, like there's that one during the, the Reichardt van Basten era, which just looks outrageously beautiful. And mm. like I I just think that you, you can put out any kit from uh, from Italy at the, during that era and it's absolutely perfect. It's also, uh, tellingly, peak Adidas, I think, at this point. I know they've obviously been very, very successful since, but like the, this Predator at the time, the Predator Accelerator, like you have their two main faces on the pitch at the time here in, in Zidane and Beckham. Even if you Google Predator right now, chances are that the two athletes that will pop up in your Google images are Zinedine Zidane and David Beckham and they're both playing uh, in this game. Like if, if you're watching The Last Dance, that last week they showed how Adidas completely screwed up in basketball. They nailed 90s football, I think, having both of these guys on board. Here's sure. a very quick question for you with 2020 vision. If there was VAR right now, would people in Zaggy score more goals or less goals? I think he's a genius, so I would say more goals because he's going to learn to uh, he's going to learn where the cutoff point of the uh, defender's um, arm is, and he's going to he's, he's going to find Pippo and Zaggy is going to find a way to cheat. There will be nuclear war, <laughs> and afterwards there will be cockroaches, rats, and Pippo and Zaggy scoring goals. That's my prediction. <laughs> No, less goals. 100% less goals. Because it, it, it just comes back to the good old cliche that if there was an offside decision that was uh, a bit of a grey area previously, you always gave the benefit of the doubt to the forward. We've been told this since See, wonder, was invented. That, that's what I wonder. That's what I really wonder, Owen, actually. Because the first thing you think about with people in Zaggy is he's offside. And I wonder, did that just sink into the minds of referees and linesmen at the time that, oh, look, he's... He's five yards ahead of the defender. He must be offside. It's in Zaggy. He's always offside. And it's just easy to give it. Mm. So, yeah, he'll actually, when you see the video, he's onside. There was one last thing that I wanted to mention, and that was Angelo Peruzzi's kick. 
he looks like I would look now, age 42, if I had six pints and went out for a kick around on the green, if we were allowed to, and social distancing was all observed, <laughs> and then started kick, throwing the ball up and waiting for it to kind of come down and then <laughs> hooking it off like 20 yards. It was unbelievable. He couldn't learn to kick the ball out. Yeah, and uh, Peter Schmeichel throwing the ball 500 metres, basically, mm. uh, managing to find a centre circle with, it, with his throwing. Uh, when goalkeepers are goalkeepers. Um, just to finish up then, a couple of bits of reaction. I think we all know what happens next. It's Bayern Munich, it is the treble. They do it uh, in the Champions League final in Barcelona without Scholes, without Keane. In the immediate aftermath of this game, uh, Alex Ferguson comes out and says, it's a proud, proud moment for me, but refers to it being a tragedy to be missing Roy Keane and Paul Scholes for the final. Sliding doors is one of the last topics we get into here in the Classic Game Club. And we've only got one question to ask. What if... Roy Keane didn't get a second, or sorry, a yellow card that night in Turin. Does much change? Well, I would wonder how we would look back at Keane in terms of the all-time greats. So obviously in Ireland he's recognised, but even still there's questions at times in England when they're picking all-time Premier League 11s as to where he fits in. And then in terms of world football, he never really gets a look in. Like if he hadn't been booked, if he had gone on and led Manchester United to a commanding performance in the Champions League final, because remember, they were really poor, by and large, in that Champions League final, and United win the treble. Like, is Keane in contention to be World Footballer of the Year? Like, you look at that year, Rivaldo wins World Football of the Year. Beckham is second. Gabriel Batistuta is third for scoring a load of goals for Fiorentina. That, or is Keane just so unfashionable as a central midfielder that he's never really going to get in the reckoning? He doesn't even get in the top 10. Like, Andy Cole and Dwight York are voted into the top 10 for World Footballer of the Year. Keane doesn't even get a look in. The, the, the 99 Ballon d'Or, um, Roy Keane comes sixth. So he gets... Well, there's two different awards. Yeah, so that's for the Ballon d'Or. It's the World Player of the Year, he comes down. But like for the Ballon d'Or in 99, obviously, he had a better chance. He finishes higher up. Like I'm not sure does that... Does it, I guess it could potentially swing the vote. It depends what sort of game he has in the final. I just think that... The points here, are, there's just such a huge gulf between Rivaldo and Roy Keane. Like Beckham was the only United player who might have gone close. I think in the year 2000, when he scores the winner in the um, World Club Cup, which is obviously undervalued because they immediately play another World Club Cup very soon afterwards, I think this is kind of the peak level of him. So there was definitely a chance for him to become... Do you remember when, when Javi was voted whatever, fifth in the Ballon d'Or and the Daily Mail had that famous headline, oh, the world's four best footballers and Javi. It was like... It was almost as if people didn't understand the value of having a midfielder in your team. It was like the game exists as a goalkeeper and strikers and there's nothing in between. Keane would have changed that if he played in the final because the hagiography from the semi-final would have happened and then he would have played in the final, they would have won. And I think then it becomes this kind of, oh, we, we need to stop thinking of Roy Keane as just a thug. Bear in mind, he'd been sent off the week before against Arsenal in that um, in the Giggs game. Like, mm. So he still had a very controversial reputation as hard man, thug, likely to stamp on you as score a goal type thing, which, you know, again, was just a cartoonish representation of his talents that the English tabloid media in particular fed. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a good shot, I think. I, like, I, I really just think it's two what-ifs, though. It's, it's what if he doesn't get suspended for the final, and then what if he actually does go on to have a game that the world actually responds by sitting up and taking notice in a way that's like, this guy's clearly the best player in the world. I just think that's too much of a, of a jump um, from from the what if question of Roy Key not getting a yellow card in that second leg. Uh, just a final thing, just to, to wrap up on then, is our over and under questions. Just a couple of rapid fire questions in terms of things being overrated or underrated after watching this game back uh, in 1999. We've gone through Roy Keane uh, already. So the first, the only player actually I want to ask you about here uh, in terms of his performance and his reputation at the time, Edgar Davids. Was he overrated or underrated? Uh, on that performance, I would say underrated. But you look at his age. So he's just been part of an Ajax team that have won the Champions League. He's becoming one of the more dominant midfielders in Europe. And you expect he's going to kick on over the next four or five years and maybe become the best midfielder in Europe. And he's part of a Juventus side that fades pretty quickly under Ancelotti, goes to Milan, doesn't do a huge amount there either. And I think on this performance, you're looking at a player who was probably underrated at that time, but just didn't deliver on his promise. Sure. 
Yeah, I, th I think he doesn't deliver on his promise, but like the high heights that he reaches are, are super high, you know, like a, an iconic. I loved him. I loved the glasses. I loved the dreads. I loved the, the ads at that time that he was in the cage football that um, Nike had a campaign around one of the um, summer tournaments. Like definitely. And watching this, his sweet, sweet left foot, which, you know, so rare to see somebody in the middle of midfield who is playing left foot passes and clip balls and all that kind of stuff. And uh, super exciting to see him. Like, I, th I think that he's about correctly rated for the ultimate achievements that his career ends up being. Carlo Ancelotti, overrated or underrated? Well, you can't argue with the trophies is the one thing uh, Carlo Ancelotti will put at you. I think there's always been questions about him tactically. What he's brilliant at is getting the best generally out of very good players. I think in this game we saw that, that tactically, did he panic? Like, was this a situation again, Martin O'Neill against Denmark, making too many changes at half time when the game was still very much in the balance, wanting to get another striker on the pitch, but sacrificing Delivio out on the, the left hand side. Clearly, he didn't do enough when he came in at Juventus because she said he finished seventh that season. The next season, what they win the Intertoto Cup, nothing much happens from a team that had been probably the best team in Europe for three or four years at that stage uh, was overrated. You know, I think a very good manager who has ended up at the right club at the right time on a consistent basis. And then final question, Antonio Conte's hair, overrated or underrated? Well, then or now? Barely there. Question, because, uh, mm -hmm. so when you, it's one of the first things I noticed when uh, the match starts. He obviously is the captain. He comes to shake hands with Roy Keane. And I'm like, hmm, there's a, a lot of hair missing there. And I'm wondering, like, what happens with Antonio Conte over the next 20 years? Does he, does he go to Pep Guardiola route and shave it off? Like, does he go for some sort of old-fashioned comb-over? What happens with Antonio Conte's hair as it continues to recede over the next 20 years? Oh, mm -hmm. magic. Just, magic. Oh, look at that. We've just we got a beautiful image here of... Wow. Those, he looks like Pippo and Zaghi in 1999, except Antonio <laughs> Conte's in 2015 there, or whenever it is. Beautiful locks. He looks better now. He sure does. He does. Fair play to him. I'm telling you, it's, uh, it's amazing what money can do for people these days. <laughs> you, you can still see the reflection of Dennis Irwin in his eyes and the look of fear Oof. in Antonio Conte at that moment. Uh, listen, lads, I think it's fair to say that the game itself is underrated. It, I could watch it again and again and again, the first half in particular. Absolutely epic. Jerry Nathan, thanks a million. Uh, this has been our review. I'm, oh, go on, Jer, one last thing. I'm, a, I'm about to watch it again. Yeah, there you go. Uh, gorge on it again and again and again. That's what lockdown is for. This has been our 1999 Champions League semi-final second leg review of uh, Manchester United and Juventus. This has been the Classic Game Club here on OTB and Virgin Media Sport. We'll chat to you next time. Bye-bye.